Hi everyone, uh, it's Stani from Make Music Your Own and with our interview series on your voice. Uh, today it's episode six and uh, as you might have noticed in light, in light of recent events, we didn't have our episode last week and um, haven't posted much uh, at all last week. And I just wanted to say, I wanted to use uh, on your voice, Make Music Your Own and um, my voice personally as a way to give chance for uh, black people to uh, to express themselves, black musicians and entrepreneurs. I wanna give you this platform to step here, uh, step in here. I wanna share um, uh, the, your experience. I wanna hear more about what you're doing. If you, uh, you are a black musician or entrepreneur and wanna share what you're doing, I'd love for this to be a platform for you. And if you uh, know of a black musician or entrepreneur who would like to share their voice, uh, this is a platform for them and it's a platform for them to um, for to be heard, and it always is and it always will be. So um, I hope to hear um, from viewers um, and any time throughout, um, whenever you think of somebody, feel free to uh, contact me, uh, and I'll be happy for this to be a platform um, for Black musicians to express what they're doing, to share with the world uh, everything about their doing. So uh, today is episode six and it's called the orchestral entrepreneur and uh, with me i have the uh my guest ryan dark who is an incredible trumpet player he's a principal trumpet of la opera and today he'll share um more about oh just sorry i just remembered something that my setting <laughs> uh here we go see i always forget about this setting <laughs> yes now we're yes now it should be good okay cool um, so just a reminder, uh, if you want to comment, um, tell us your name or just uh, give a stream your permission um, so we can see uh, your name and we can mention you and say hi. So hi, say hi from wherever you are, wherever you're quarantined and um, any thoughts uh, throughout the week, uh, what's happening, feel free to share. This is a conversation for uh, everyone who's joining. Um, so again, uh, I have with me Ryan Dark, uh, principal trumpet player of LA Opera. And today we're talking about what it's like to be an orchestral uh, entrepreneur. Uh, Ryan just started uh, this incredible um, trumpet festival. I mean, it's going to launch in a few days, um, but he started recently, and uh, he'll tell us more about it. And uh, I can't wait for everything we're going to talk about today. So here, without further ado, here's Ryan Dark. Hi, Ryan. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for that inter intro. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, can you tell us more about your background, your story, and uh, how you got to where you are today, just for people who don't know what you are? Okay, well, you know, work backwards. I'm in Long Beach now, um, mm -hmm. where I also teach at Cal State Long Beach, and I am an LA Opera principal trumpet. Um, I bounced around a bunch, played in um, Baltimore Symphony for a year, San Diego Symphony for a year, some small contracts in Auckland and Norway and Malaysia, you know, just done a lot. Yeah. And yeah, I taught at University of Arizona for a couple of years. So I've kind of been all over the map. Um, went to mm -hmm. Colburn, Rice and Cal State Long Beach for my schooling. And um, I also grew up in this area. So to be back mm -hmm. teaching and performing in my hometown after going all over the darn place uh, is pretty <laughs> is pretty awesome. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of like my story and what I do. And mm -hmm. um, Trumpet Forward was basically created for my students. I started posting videos on YouTube. I started doing warm-up classes, but I noticed that I was doing warm-up classes. And by the end of the day, I'd had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and then thousands of people stopping by and I'd get all these text messages or screenshots of my friends or my friends would hold up their phone playing with playing, warming up with my video later in the day. And I'm like, wow, everyone really likes, you know, doing these warm-ups. Everyone likes talking shop with me. And I got so many requests for lessons from people I'd never heard of. And I was like, wow, I, I couldn't even, I, I actually still, I feel a little bad. I, I couldn't give all the lessons that were was requested of me. I was like, I'm so sorry. I just can't. Like I got like 50 lessons in a week. I'm like, I don't know what to do other than I can't, you know, because I had my Cal State Long Beach um, students. I have 13 yeah. there and I teach at yeah. Colburn as well. I was just already booked. Um, so this actually, the whole festival kind of came up for my students. Like I didn't come at it as a business venture. And uh -huh. at, at the only point that it turned into a business venture is when I started 
asking my colleagues to do things for me. <laughs> you know, I called in some favors. Hey, would you mind doing this free class? So, you know, and I'm like, okay, now I have to also pay these people. I'm not just going to ask favors from all my friends, yeah, you know, yeah. and the, the, the favors from my friends, you know, I've, I've learned that everyone was so willing and generous um, mm -hmm. to do these classes for me. And that was super nice, but I think they also got a lot out of it. You know, other people even reached out, like they wanted to join in and give a class. Like, it's like all of a sudden I became the point man for like a lot of people, you know? And, um, that was really, that was really interesting to just see like the, to, to realize that like teaching is also a privilege, like learning is a privilege, creating a business is a privilege, but teaching and like being the leader is also good for, good for ourselves. It like helps motivate us. It helps um, keep us focused too. So as much as I'm grateful for the business side of it or whatever, mm -hmm. like I'm really actually like definitely respect the role as the person that's a leader, you know, because I'm just a student too. I'm still trying to learn yeah. every, every day. So I'll take that role of the leader to, to create this community, but like mm -hmm. it's, I think it's special on all fronts, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I love what you said. And like, I totally agree that the greatest businesses really come from a place of service when you really want to help somebody. That's when you really realize, well, I guess it's a business by way of just you wanting to serve and you wanting to fulfill a bigger purpose and something that you want to do for the people we care for. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, what are some, did you find that there were certain skills or um, different experiences and things that helped you uh, from your orchestral uh, background that helped you as you went into building this um, online festival? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I'm hesitant to say like organization and like, oh, I was so organized for, you know, <laughs> just in preparation to help me organize this because probably some of my faculty members would be like, he was not completely organized <laughs> in the beginning. And like still now I'm making errors, you know, but like on, I was able to organize 20 people's schedules, create 20, we have 20 plus students all getting three to six lessons each and they all have to be scheduled. I have people in London, I have people in Auckland, I have people on the East Coast and, you know, doodle polls and students from all over, and, you know, just making the things work. Yeah. Um, I would say organizationally, although I've had a couple missteps, um, I've corrected them or am mm -hmm. finishing correcting them now. And mm -hmm. uh, I've learned along the way so much, like the growth curve for me was, mm -hmm. was very, yeah steep and fast um so i think that part of orchestral um performance and, and playing helped me just like mm -hmm. and, and tenacity you know you don't win an orchestral job or you don't last as a musician as a professional unless you have tenacity right so uh -huh. the tenacity i took into my career as a performer i also take into my teaching i also took into this business i i kind of it sounds cliche but i don't really like doing anything half halfway, you know, I really like to, to go all the way. If I'm going to yeah. do this, if I'm going to like put my name on a thing and say trumpet forward, my thing's going to be the best or whatever, <laughs> or what I perceive to. And I still actually think it might be one of the better things out there. You know, it's incredible. Lot yeah, it's, I, I saw your promo video like a month ago, as soon as he came out, I was just blown away. Cause I remember oh, it was in April. We talked about like plans for the summer. What are we doing in COVID? And you had this idea. It was just like the, just the very beginning of it. And a month yes. later, it was just this huge thing. So it's really, really incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think when we it. talked, when we talked, it was like, I think I'm going to do this thing. And then I got off the three day, you know, yeah. retreat and talking yeah. and, did, and I was like, and I'm going to work 12 hours a day and have this up in next week. <laughs> yeah, really. But also that, that goes to show that we mus as musicians have that discipline ingrained in us practicing. We're used to kind of building our own routine that works for us, for our instrument, our practice, our goals. And we're also great at like finishing a project, learning a piece to, when, until it's ready for a performance. That's kind of built in, that kind of uh, progression is built into yeah. what we do. So I guess a lot of it is just transferring those skills into like, yes, make the website go contact people, uh, you know, reach out. And yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and also like, I think the thing that, you know, the reason we're talking is, is we had nice interactions at the, at the festival, we'll call yeah. it, or the event yeah. that we were at together, you know? Um, and, and it's the same in, in with my trumpet forward is that I found that there wasn't a single, well, maybe there was one like big soloist in Europe who I didn't know very well, who I like took a risk on asking who yeah. said, Oh, you know, I don't really like teaching online. So I had like one no and like 20 yeses, you know, mm -hmm. including my uh -huh. contacts at, you know, yeah. Juilliard, Louis Schiff and Nora Kagiyama, who I've known for a long time, Chris Martin, Mike Sachs, mm -hmm. Jim Will, like these just phenom, just like top of the top of the what best. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I didn't just reach out to random people. I had relationships with them. I had been playing with Chris for years. I had gone to his festivals. I had followed Mike Sachs to different festivals. I was playing principal at NOI and he sat next to me. So like some of the relationships were formed like 10 plus years ago when I was a student 
mm -hmm. I was really respectful and really curious. And they're like, oh, I remember you as a student. Like Chris said this to me, Chris Martin. I remember you as a student. I'm, I'm not surprised to see you rise to the top of the <laughs> top of the pool, Ryan. Of course, I'll do anything for you. And it was like a response within like 30 minutes from Chris Martin. I'm like, okay, that's a vote <laughs> of confidence that like literally all I have to do is ask. And he's like, and he literally said, whatever you need, I, I got it. You know, I'll make time for you. And then I sent him the schedule last week. And he's like, yep, that's great. Let me know if anything else comes in. I'm just like, so you go... So, and I don't attribute that to, to just Chris being a cool guy, who, which he is, and Mike Sachs being a great guy who he is, and Dave Elton and John Lewis, and these people that are really coveted players in our community. I think that I had, I, not, I don't think, I had and have great relationships with all of them, personally. Yeah. Like they, and I think they know that I'm not doing it as a business. I'm not trying to, I'm yeah. trying to provide this like great content for my community. And they're like, yeah, I'm in, you know, so. Yeah. That's so great. And yeah, that's so important, uh, building a community, especially I remember looking back to my college days thinking like that. I wish I knew those things when I was there in school. Like, I think I realized the importance of uh, community and making those networking and just making um, relationships with um, colleagues is so much more important than I gave it. You know, when you're in college, it's easy to just be in your practice room and in your oh, yeah. mindset and just not see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So that's so important. Uh, and um, yeah, those are things that really build over time. Right. And trust and people really knowing who you are, being able to say yes within 30 minutes. Yeah, it's a right. And that was the pressure. Well, and that was the pressure is that like, you know, I wanted to make sure this thing was just excellent because I had all these people behind me. And I think I think it will be. I think it starts Monday and it, I think it's all set up to be like just awesome for my my participants and auditors yeah. and stuff. Um, but yeah. the cool thing that I will say is that I started a brass festival last summer, Montecito at uh, Montecito Festival, which is already existing for strings and piano, but they added brass. Mm -hmm. And I started the whole brass department, had, you know, Tim Morrison, Bill Booth, Jim Thatcher, Doug Turnquist, all these amazing brass players. And it went from zero brass players. They had tried to launch it before and they got they they couldn't. And then mm -hmm. I had like 40, <laughs> you know, and and all almost all of the students that came there, I had like 13 Travis students come maybe. Almost mm -hmm. all those students are enrolled for this one. Yeah. So, and I think that's also important is that like my students that I work with at Cal State Long Beach make up a large group of the people that are coming mm -hmm. to the festival, like maybe mm -hmm. half. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's because they know that I deliver product, like the product to them. They're not like, oh, I'm tired of this guy. He says yeah. the same stuff and he kind of writes yeah. me off. They know that I'm super invested and I'm like going to provide awesome quality material to them. And same for the people that came to my festival last summer. If I would have done a bad job last summer, they wouldn't be there. But you know, I have a student that's in Philadelphia who was from Sacramento who came and now he's in this yeah. festival. And there's like three or four that I had not met before that yeah. since they had a good experience last summer, they're like, he's probably going to set up a good experience this summer. Uh -huh. So I think that kind of like consistency has been important and yeah. it's something that I strive to maintain throughout this yeah. festival. That's my yeah. goal. Uh -huh. That's terrific. That's so important, uh, especially when we teach maybe like through the years, you have a teaching job and most of us uh, probably do. And it's so easy to just find a routine and kind of forget to fully invest yourself, fully to be passionate about everything you're doing, especially if it's daily and it can be tiring. But like, I love your approach, how you're really always thinking, how can I be better? How can I bring the most to these people? What the most value at all times? So when you need them for the summer, uh, festival like this, they really want to be there because they know how you work. They know that you give it your all all the time. Yeah. And that, that kind of dedication it takes really a lot of conscious effort and, uh, and constant like really rethinking how you do things and wanting to be better. That's really, really, uh, really important. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. A few things also you mentioned earlier and kind of it's coming back to it. Um, when you, as you said, like when you felt like you step up, stepped up as a leader, you felt like people were easily coming in to see what you're doing. And, uh, and that's really true when anytime you have a project idea in mind, the moment you step out into the world with it, people will just resonate with, especially when it comes from a place of service and when something you're passionate about, uh, people will resonate with it and people will want to see what it is. People will be interested to follow you. And in, you found yourself without wanting to, you were all of a sudden you were a leader. And yeah. that happens to everyone who speaks out, who kind of comes forward with ideas that are passionate about. So I think for any musicians listening that are thinking, having project in mind, I think that's kind of important to go forward with that passion, that idea that you want to try. Yeah, try absolutely, it absolutely. There will be an audience because people want to see what you're up to, especially when you're back. Yeah. Up. And we all have that insecurity that there won't be, you know, when you're taking a leap like that. But there, I don't, I haven't experienced that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, so I, yeah. So. Especially yeah, in the music world, I think everyone's really supportive and and um, you mentioned earlier, and if, I hope you don't mind me going back, what do you find were some of the challenges? You said there are definitely some setbacks. And if you don't mind sharing, what are some things you found 
or challenging? How do you overcome them? Because that might be helpful for people, or just at least one or something you found. Yeah. Logistically, it's been a challenge, you know, just like, and, and I think that something, hmm, let me think. I'm trying to think like logistically, I asked a lot of people in the beginning, I was like, okay, I'm going to ask these 10 people, you know, and, or maybe it was even more 15 people and probably half will say no, or we'll have conflicts. And everyone said yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I have a lot of people, you know, <laughs> like I didn't expect, I didn't expect it to work out for everybody, you know? Yeah. And, and then, uh, so I think that was like, maybe something that I could have thought through a little more, a little, a little better, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that actually looking at my end result that I would have changed anything. Mm -hmm. At the time, though, it was just like growing pains, like, oh, God, I have to figure out how to manage this many people. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, last week I offered one of my graduate students um, like to be my asked her to be my assistant and gave her a large scholarship uh, to the festival and asked her to help me schedule because I was like, all right, this is going to be too much, you know. And then for the video, I had a, um, a, town, a Spanish tuba student from Colburn who was in my classes who was wanted me to he's kept asking me to coach him for some auditions. They were coming up and he's now in the finals three for Hong Kong. He's doing great. So I've been coaching him on the side. Like, it's not something I really do. I just help like certain people that ask me or that I have relationships mm -hmm. with from Colburn or one of my past students from Eastman. I'm helping him mm -hmm. like just, uh, you know, just a couple key people. And uh, and then he was like, well, if you and I was like, yeah, you don't have to pay me. He's like, well, if you need any help with the festival. And I was like, I do. <laughs> and so, so I was like, how about video editing? He's like, I've been working on video editing. I'm like, he's like, what do you need? I'm like, really? And I'm so, and I, I actually, just the way I am, I still paid him. You know, I still, I didn't ask him to do mm -hmm. anything for free. I still paid mm -hmm. him a, mm -hmm. a good amount of money because I know it took a lot of his time. And, um, but yeah, I have, I have utilized a graphic designer, someone to help me with video, um, assistant for scheduling. And that's been important to keep it afloat, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if you did it all by yourself and how much, because it, when you do something big like this, you need help more or less. Really. I did. And I've done, I think, you know, the more, if I were to do this again, and hopefully I will next year, I would do less and less, <laughs> less graphic design, yeah. less website design, mm -hmm. less PDF making, less schedule. Yeah. Like I would de de delegate a lot more than mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's important to know, like, <laughs> or that's another skill to, yeah. Especially when you do a big project like this. It can, yes. Yeah, oh my gosh. Really yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to go into something I uh, noticed uh, in your festival that you are doing some visualization and meditation uh, huh. workshops. Can you tell me a little more? I'm personally always been interested in visualization, meditation, that kind of uh, um, mental prep for uh, playing and especially in life. So I wanted um, to ask you more about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that my personality, there's a lot of things. My personality is very intense. I'm very energetic. I'm very competitive. I'm very, you know, eager and all that stuff, which is great for sports, which I was. I was like a varsity yeah. tennis player and a soccer player, ultimate frisbee, hockey, you know. Yeah. Yeah. My parents are both jocks, you know. So yeah. so I've, <clears throat> it's great for that. It's not so great for trumpet, staying balanced, you know, long, slow haul, you know, yeah. so it's, it's not really the right skill set for being a performing musician, although it comes into like competitive nature comes into play. Like when you're doing auditions, you're like, all right, let's go win this thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, overall, you don't really want to take that mentality to the practice room, pride and ego and a bunch of adrenaline. You don't really mm -hmm. want that, you know? So yeah. I had to figure out how to manage that. Um, and paired with, I got injured, I've had a couple injuries actually, but uh, one serious injury that which resulted in surgery on my lip and uh, had to come back from that. And during that time I had already been, let me think about this, if this is true. No, I think that was the start. I think that was the start of my meditation and visualization and all that stuff. And I just dove in deep. I went to the Rice Resource Center. They had like a wellness center with like a hundred CDs. And I just listened to like five a day, trying to find my favorite ones. And I did, and there was a horn player, um, I won't say his name just in case, but at Rice, that was really, really helpful. He had done some affirmations and he had done some stuff with Julie Landsman, who's wonderful at Juilliard for mm -hmm. mental stuff. And I had listened mm -hmm. to some of her stuff. Um, and I just start Bill Vermeulen was talking about affirmations and, and positive imagery with his students in his master classes. And then um, Norman Fisher, who's a cello teacher there. I had some one-on-one -on -one meetings with him when I was injured because I had heard he had a couple injured students and he taught about um, mental imagery. And, and there was this book um, by Bruce Adolfi or Adolfa. Oh, yes. um, 
You know that book? Uh, I know him. I know Bruce. Oh, do you? Oh, cool. He wrote this I'm book. Him, but like, I know who he is, but I haven't read the book yet. Oh, okay. He has this book. Uh, yeah, most people don't know it. I think it's out of print or maybe it's back now. It was called uh, Hearing hearing your inner ear or imagining your inner ear or something like that. It was wow. just like visualization exercises and I started doing those. So it was mostly started because I just needed to like stay positive when I was having my <laughs> career on the line with the surgery. Yeah. I was yeah. getting steroid shots in my lip. I didn't know if I was going to come out of it and I wanted to come out strong. And, uh, and I did, I came out so strong. I was, and then I started meditating like 45 minutes twice a day at that time. I was doing visualization of healing. I was doing visualization of like what it was going to feel like when it was all done. Um, I did affirmations, which was a big Bill Vermeulen thing as well. Once again, um, uh, writing positive statements and reading them to yourself before you practice. And I just started like, you know, putting a lot of positivity and focus into my practice before and after the, the, my, my, my uh, injury. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, built myself to be <laughs> way stronger mentally than I ever could have imagined, you know? I mean, yeah. a year a year after my surgery, I was in Boston auditioning for Schleswig Holstein, and I was lucky enough to be get principal in the or in Schleswig Holstein Orchestra. I played Mahler 5 on tour with Eschenbach. Yeah. And that was that was no less than one year after my surgery, literally. Wow. So um, you know, that was crazy. I could have never I did I didn't really imagine, but I kind of did because I bought a plane ticket from Rice to <laughs> to Boston to go win this. You know, yeah. that's how confident I was coming yeah. out of having my face sliced open. So it doesn't that doesn't happen by accident, you yeah. know. It only happens by like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. And um yeah, so that's how I got into it. And then when I was at Colburn as a student, uh everyone was stressed. Everyone's getting ready for auditions. Everyone's feeling the pressure. And I was like super calm and always met. And they're like, what are you, how are you so like relaxed about this? And I'm like, oh, well, I've been doing like affirmations, meditation. I remember this uh, gal, Kate, uh, bass player. She was like, can you teach me? I'm like, yeah. So like, so she'd be like on the floor of my bedroom and I'd be on my bed and I'd be like, all right, we're going to listen to this track. I'm going to like walk you through how to do it. And then I did it with like my other friend, Titus, I think. And, uh, you know, I just started taking my friends through it. I was like, all right, so because because everyone loved it, I kept doing it. And um, I think it's been, you know, invaluable for me as a performer, like meditation and focus mm -hmm. and, and visualization. Yeah, it's so great. And it's so important to nurture our mindset, to really nurture the way we approach things uh, and really be conscious of it. It's so much of it. It's easy to just pass by without us being conscious. Things happen mm -hmm. to us and we don't take accountability for what it is, how it happened. We, we just keep going and we don't notice a lot of important things. And sometimes in your case, you had to stop because you had like a physical injury and I yeah. spoken to other guests like Sarah Whitney, she was saying the same thing, how like really awareness and kind of focusing on consciousness helped her recover more. So that's mm. so, so important. Um, always, especially musicians, because we're sharing so much of everything we are as musicians when we play, oh, yeah. it's not just, we're not just playing notes, but so being more stable and healthy and, um, aware of our consciousness is so, so important. Right. Um, do you have any tips or any, for any musicians who haven't, uh, gone into visualization and meditation anything that they could start with a place or resource they could explore as the beginning yeah i mean i have a list of stuff that i give my students and i'd be happy to share that with anyone that was really wow. interested they could just email me um, mm -hmm. um and that's like a really nice listing of stuff but mm -hmm. you know there's a zen habits blog by mm -hmm. leo it's a great blog and he has like if you want to start to meditate here you go two minutes a day and here's how you do it you know right. breathe through your nose follow the sound of your breathing set a two minute timer done mm -hmm. You can also use Headspace, the app. They have 10 days of free meditations. And I never thought I would recommend an app. Uh, I started meditating, was going to meditation centers. I went to the Green Gold Zen Farm in San Francisco. I've done all the like, I've done hardcore, you know, yeah. you know, real stuff. Some Buddhist yeah. monks in Baltimore when I was playing there, I hung out with, you know, I've done the real thing. But okay. I'm, I'm telling you, the Headspace app is just as good. Like there's yeah. animations and it's like they're really well done. And yeah, you put, you put it on, you put the duration. Um, it gives you a little instruction and guides mm -hmm. you through it. And like, that's a super easy way to get started, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, you, for performance, you can try Kenny Warner's Effortless Mastery. I have that book actually right, right yeah. behind me there. <laughs> um, and uh, Effortless Mastery comes with a CD and there are four meditations, which are, are fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Bell Ruth Napperstack has great stuff. Um, Stephen Gurkovich and Andrew Weil have some great relaxation RX uh, CDs. Um, 
And then uh, affirmations, there, there's actually like great resources for how to make affirmations. Bill Vermeulen has a video uh, and uh, just positive statements that you say to yourself mm -hmm. like five times, five mm -hmm. statements that you say five times each before you practice mm -hmm. or before you perform. Just mm -hmm. getting yourself like pumping yourself up with positive thoughts before you practice or before you perform. That's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of little things. It doesn't have to take a ton of time. And the, the, I think the misconception is that with meditation, you need to do, like I said, I was doing 45 minutes twice a day, which I was doing is because it was a troubling time and I needed to really calm myself. But yeah. like, honestly, five minutes, three times a day or 10 minutes twice or, or five minutes twice is basically enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's so great. Especially, yeah, you can start simple and small with your phone. You have you have everything around you that you need. Yeah, yeah. put the phone on, put earplugs on, five minutes. Exactly. Yeah. I want to take a second to say hi to Annie. Thanks for joining us. Hi to Ellen. Ellen, if she likes my plant, that's my new plant. Money. <laughs> hey, I got a plant too. I want to I want to join the plant party. Oh, Look at that. Okay. <laughs> Just need a plant here. Yeah. Um, and Jeffrey Strong says TM was a life changer for me. Who? What? what who was? TM is that one of the authors you mentioned? Um, oh. from your sources, I think. Pro TM, the initials of uh, an author, probably. Oh, Bella with Napperstack is that? TM. Yeah. Oh. See. I don't know. Jeff is my good friend. Yeah. We Jeff have plays in LA Phil, and I've shared a lot of these resources. Oh, with cool. awesome. oh, oh, Headspace maybe? No. Total. Yeah. Uh, not sure. Jeff, yeah. help us out. Anyways. Thanks for joining us, Jeffrey. Thanks so much. Yeah, Jeff's the um, best. Um, that's he's teaching at my festival. He's part of the festival. One of the right. esteemed teachers is doing an audition preparation class and organization. He's just, he's the best. Yeah. That's so awesome. You know, I was literally seeing the video, the promo video I did. And I was like, I really, I was so excited. I was, wish I played the trumpet. And I, <laughs> I was, yes. Cause it was just like, oh my God, people from all over the world. You have like yeah. everything you need to be like a well-rounded musician. Like if you're like going to college or any age, really, there's just so much in it. And I just wanted to go back to that. Um, and, um, before that, actually, I wanted to ask you if you would, uh, there's anything, um, any advice you would give musicians right now who are thinking of starting their own project or haven't really explored online teaching or and are just wondering what to do? What is an advice you would give them from your experience? You know, give it a try. Yeah, just just dive in and do it. It feels kind of scary at first. And there's a learning curve and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to need to upgrade your audio and you're going to hate your video. And, you know, you're going to like, basically, I think if you, we are, we are all performers and we like to deliver a certain con quality of content and you're going to fall short and then you're going to make take the next step up and then you're going to fall short and then you're going to take the next step up. But you have to take the first step. And my first videos for my students on YouTube, which I thought no one would ever watch, were hilariously bad with no microphones, no lighting. I was wearing a hat. I was talking in accents. It was bad. I was like talking like a hillbilly, like, come on, kids, it's time to work. Like, it was so, it was completely completely insane it was like very clear that like three months ago i did not have any idea of becoming a <laughs> person with regards to this um and uh, i took that one off because a large institution was give, interviewing me and i did not want them to find that when they searched my <laughs> name so <laughs> we just recently i was like okay that has to go down but everything else is staying up so that you can see my trajectory of crappy to slightly better now uh -huh. product that i'm putting out um so yeah i would just say you know give it a shot and do it. Make sure it's something that you're genuinely passionate about. Make sure that's something that you think people need. Um, that's that's one thing. That's one thing that I would say is like make sure, like my whole thing. This whole thing didn't start off as a as something business wise, and it still it still actually isn't. It's more like a like a passion project. Like I'm excited that I am running the fest this festival because I'm gonna learn so much. Like <laughs> if it was just me and all my guests, I would be like, this is the best thing ever. I'll take all the lessons, you know, because like all these people are so great and I'm always committed to like learning and that's why I'm the right person to have put this together. So you mm -hmm. have to make sure you put yourself in the situation in which you naturally thrive the most. Like I think and I think people know that about me that I'm like always curious I'm always asking questions I'm open to learning I try not you know I try to I'm okay passing the torch and and giving the floor to you know people that yeah. I respect yeah. I don't need to control and hold all the cards it's not just yeah. me one man yeah. show Ryan Dark Festival yeah. you know I'm not like that um so yeah I would say like find the thing that makes you feel comfortable and the thing you think you do best and stick with that with that focus you know mm -hmm. that's so great that's so, that's such a great advice and really anytime you're tapping into your strength and thinking of who you want to be surrounded with how what you want to create I mean kind of 
visualizing it too. I think that's so important too, honestly, being able to see what that's going to look like. That already is like half the planning, knowing what you're comfortable with, knowing what your passion is and the people yeah. you want to share it with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people told me that I wasn't charging enough for my festival and like that I, that I wasn't, that I was doing too much or had too many guests. It was going to cost me too much. And there's like, you should be charging double what you're charging. And I was like, you know, actually <laughs> like there is a couple situations where some people who are registering might not be that uh, like affluent naturally or have a ton of resources because they're students. And they wrote me and they're like, you know, I can, I can just barely make this work because of this and this and this reason. I'm really excited. Da, 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 da. And I was like, this is so much better than making it like super expensive and unattainable and mm -hmm. elitist. You know, like I really feel like it, I, I have one option that's to be able to attend all of the events, all of the classes, all of the seminars, warm up classes, performance psychology is $750 for five weeks. That's you know, and a lesson with me yeah. included. So it's like a lesson and like five weeks of basically com events. It's like, I and mean, I yeah. So, so I feel really good. I feel, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is like, make sure that you feel good about what you're offering, the price you're offering at the accessibility level that you're offering it at, because all of the teachers that join my festival, Jeff and Jim, John Lewis, um, Rob Freer, um, Dave Elton, Chris Martin, they all also said similar things like, Hey, I know this is a weird time. You know, I know I would normally charge this much per hour, but because it's online and because of the struggling times, I'm going to, you know, be able to provide lessons for this rate at rate per hour. Yeah. So I can't take their concession and their sensitivity to the, to the time and the, the dynamic right now. And then be like, and now I'm going to mark it up and make this because I think, I think you want one me or others could have easily done that. Because, yeah. because they know like, huh, all these people don't have work. I bet you they're willing to work for less. I yeah. bet you if I put them all together, I can get people to pay a lot more. And I just wasn't willing to do that. I was like, all right, what's what's a respectable thing where I can pay them res respectably, make a little money for all of this effort and graphic design, website design, Vimo, it's hundred, you know, thousands of dollars of expenses and and still feel good about it. And that's and that's what I did. So I think that's important too, is to like stay true to your values. Don't Don't like don't sell out, you know, just because it's a business doesn't mean you have to like sell out. Yeah. That's so important. Absolutely. It's huge. And yeah. um, we're going to wrap it up. Could you just give us like a little quick overview again, for those of you who join us later. And also those of you who haven't seen the video, just like okay. who's going to be there and just quick, just uh, so people know it. Uh, okay. By the way, is it pretty much, it's almost filled out, right? Or there's spots? Yeah. There? there are like a couple participant spots. Um, I think we're at 20 participants and I capped it at 25, like, and that's, if I get to 25, I'll have to like make some extra room in the schedule, but that's okay. And then audit auditors, I'm still accepting. I'm accepting oh, 10, 10 auditors and there are like four now. So there's still, okay. there's still some spots if they're, the yes. auditor thing was opened up um, after the fact because the participant thing was so full. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? I want some people to be able to participate that are, that are not full participants. Yeah. Um, but the, but we have, you know, we have four resident faculty members and um, Jim Wilt, Jeff Strong, John Lewis, mm -hmm. and Tony Prisk from the Philadelphia Orchestra. And uh, those four teachers are teaching three to six lessons to our participants. They get mm -hmm. to decide if they want three or six lesson package. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting private lessons on top of Alexander Technique with Lori Schiff, Performance mm -hmm. Psychology with Noah Kagiyama, Yoga with Kim Purdy. And then there are classes, seminars, master classes from about 15 of my close friends. And I'll try to list them all off, like West Point <laughs> Band, Bill Owens, Kevin Bozinski in the Air Force Band, Phil Snedeker uh, from Washington Symphonic Brass, Steve O'Connor from Presidio Brass. Uh, we have Rob Freer from the Hollywood Bull Orchestra, you know, Mike Sachs from the Cleveland Orchestra, Dave Elton from the London Symphony Orchestra, Chris Martin from the yeah. New York Philharmonic. <laughs> Um, we have uh, Derek Anong, who's doing a Caruso a fitness and maintenance class. We have uh, uh, Phyllis Stork, who's a famous mouthpiece maker from Boston, coming in to talk about selecting the right mouthpiece. We have Bob Malone from Yamaha talking about how to pick the best equipment and trumpets for the job. So, oh my gosh, I wonder if that was everybody. I hope that was that was pretty pretty close to everybody. But there, I know I'm I'm yeah. sure I'm forgetting you know a couple of people. Rob Shear is coming in, who's an amazing studio player in Los Angeles. My second mm -hmm. trumpet player at LA Opera, Dave Washburn, who's like one of the best piccolo players in the world, is coming in to do a class on piccolo trumpet playing. Um, so I'm trying really hard to not forget anybody yeah, here off, to, right off the top of my head. But. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure people hear like the like the vastness of this festival and how much oh, like, like yeah. what people are getting. So if you know anyone or if you're interested to audit the 
that's why there's still spots and uh, highly recommend it. Um, thank you, Ryan, so much for being here yeah. today for your Thanks time. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. You too. Uh, take care and we'll talk soon. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.